Welcome to AHG Connects, where voices, information, and resources are empowered intentionally. So, Dr. Arnold, I'm going to give you the pleasure of really introducing someone that the country became uh aware of admired it and love because without without his leadership during hurricane katrina lord have mercy where new orleans would have been mm-hmm. so please yeah i just want to start out you know this is um about someone who's near and dear uh to my heart yeah. uh as a military hero and uh Re- lieutenant general russell honore and i'm praying that uh, dc is listening right now he needs to have a four star that man, and, uh, yeah. you know, before he does anything else in this earth, he needs to have that fourth star. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, he, you know, he was the eighth of uh, 12 children uh, born in Louisiana. And his parents, Udell and uh, Lloyd Honore, you know, gave birth to him and his siblings. But his wife, Be- Beverly, lives with him now down uh, in Baton Rouge. As well, he has four children, Stephanie who actually helped us, you know, with uh, the show for many years, you know, making sure that he uh, was on the show. Absolutely. And was able to talk to us. Uh, she was been a, a godsend to help us. Um, also, he has uh, Kimberly as a daughter and Stephen and Michael as sons, who are actually military personnel, too, are military members, uh, still uh, actively engaged with uh, defending our nation. But um, he has one of his favorite uh, quotes was, um, ignorance can be fixed, stupidity stupidity is for lifetime so he has he has you can't be cursed for a lifetime with stupidity oh, oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> come on that's and, rough you know, <laughs> but it may, it may I explain think, you I know think that's pretty true <laughs> but in practice probably so but, yeah you know, but come on you gotta, you gotta give him some hope exactly. <laughs> but his, fa- his favorite food is gumbo um <laughs> he went to southern university where he was an avid rotc member uh and uh, A&M College in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where he studied vocational um, agriculture. Um, he had 37 years in the military, and that's a long time. That's a long time. You don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that's a long time. Yeah. He entered the military in 1971 as an infantry uh, officer in the U.S. Army Combat Development Command. In 2004, he became the 33rd commanding general U.S. First Army at Fort Gillum, Georgia. Um, He was involved in flooding in Venezuela, Mozambique, and Hurricanes Floyd, Charlie, Francis, Ivan, Jean, Katrina, Rita. Mm. In 2005, he was designated uh, as the commander of the Joint Task Force uh, Katrina when uh, FEMA was having some difficulties uh, responding. Um, he was des- desig- uh, designated as commander of the J- Joint Task Force Katrina. As the assistant G1 personnel, 1st Infantry Division forward in support of Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield, um, he had a culture of preparedness that he has con- inculcated for America. And you remember he was drive, you know, riding through Louisiana during the middle of a hurricane and turned around and was looking at people and saying, put those weapons down. These are American citizens. Right. He was protecting people here at home as he did overseas. Yeah. He joined the Gallup organization as a senior scientist. He's also on the faculty of Emory University Rollins School of Public Health and the Nell Hodgson School of Nursing. He's also a CNN preparedness uh, contributor I've seen him so many times coming on and with global warming, I know we're going to be seeing him over and over again, unfortunately, because of what's going on with our nature and and what's happening with the world right now. But he also was a public speaker and a Kepler speaker out of Arlington, Virginia. He uh, has several books, uh, Survival, How a Culture of Preparedness Can Save You and Your Family from Disasters. I've read that book and the other two I'm going to mention. One is leadership in the new normal. And of course, don't get stuck on stupid. <laughs> yeah. you know, he's trying to tell you, this is a general now. He's not going to tell you light in a light way 
what you should be doing to get yourself together and understand the world mm -hmm. and what your responsibility in it is as a citizen and as a military uh, active uh, duty member or in the, in the reserves. He has six honorary doctorates, one from Stillman College and um, one from the U.S. Army War College included in that. In 2006, he received the NACP Humanitarian Award, and he has keys to the cities in uh, Chisholm, Minnesota, Riverdale, Georgia, St. Bernard Parish, Louisiana, and New Orleans, Louisiana. And I may have to visit him because I'm going to go down to Louisiana. You know, my wife wants to go down and visit New Orleans and you know, I have to stop by him and say, you have the key to the city. You know, maybe you can get me into some of the clubs. <laughs> <laughs> some of that gumbo. But, you know, yeah. he might have some. I, I want the gumbo too. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's going to be on the thing. Um, also, he uh, has the distinguished, um, uh, you know, he has a Defense Distinguished Service Medal and an Army Distinguished Service Medal. And over, over time, we have been so honored to have him as part of the America's Heroes Group. He has been uh, guiding us and giving us um, insights that people can have to make sure that they protect themselves, you know, within this nation. So when you have some, someone so iconic as him, you have to have, you know, you have to step aside for a second and say, this is someone that we should be honoring while he is living. And, you know, anything, anytime you can go and take a look at, you know, any of his podcasts or his you know, downloads or anything like that, you need to have, you know, you need to have, uh, take time to understand and learn from someone that has that much to offer us um, as people, as military people. Mm -hmm. And you learn the history, you know, of who we are, right. why we are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he, he sent me a picture of um, him on his horse. And I was like, man, <laughs> wow. that horse looks mean. I said, if I was a Russian or someone from other some other country, I'd be scared. If I was a dictator, <laughs> I'd be like, man, I'm not going. I'm not approaching that hill. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of who he is. He's, he he kind of gives you the the iconic general look. He is a he's a true thoroughbred general. Yes, and that's not you don't see that too often in militaries around the world. He's the guy that leads the charge. He's the guy on the horse. He's the guy that you know. Like, like right now, he's saying his theme is circle the wagons. We're going to talk about leadership and talk about leadership quality, especially particularly with the commander in chief we have to elect pretty soon. Mm -hmm. But circle the wagons. Don't be pissing in your boots. Get out there and get tough when the tough gets going. So I mean, this guy really, when you listen to him speak, listen to what he has to say, he is the epitome of toughness. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. And you definitely need that. You mm -hmm. got to have somebody who's going to be able to do that. And there aren't many people, as we know, that can fill that position. Yeah. You yes. Know? Yeah. What you mm -hmm. just said is right on point. Yeah. We need a kick yeah. in the butt sometimes every now and again. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's sort of the thing that I think also, too, is really important. You know, when we talk about leadership um, in this country, we have there is a leadership void that's going on right now because when we look at and I'm, let's keep it real. We have two weak candidates running for president. There's no way to get around that. However, when we look at leadership and what it means for the country, we still still have to make a decision. Oftentimes, the lesser of two evils, unfortunately, most a lot of elections, that's what it has been. It's been the lesser of two evils. Mm -hmm. But we still you still have to look at your candidate. If you're going to pick a candidate, look at your candidate, understand what that person really stands for. Mm -hmm. You know, because when you're looking at a candidate who's uh, maybe uh, caring more about their sponsors and donors, or they caring more about the country. Are they caring more about their own agenda or they're caring about the country? Are they wrapped up in ideology, which a lot of leaders sometimes get wrapped up into ideology that takes you nowhere that does not improve the country. OK, we got to look at those things and actually try to pick a leader that's actually going to lead this country. Because we have some real tough decisions that we have to look at coming up in the, in the future. What we see in the, with the Supreme Court, given, you know, the, 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 the president, carte blanche, and pretty much immunity for the most part. Mm -hmm. You know, that's 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 yeah. scary. Yeah. Are we going to try to be we're trying to be like like Putin's Russia? Is that what we're trying to go? Yeah. Is that the direction right. we're trying right. to go into? Yeah. No, what are we what is what is going on here? I mean, we have we we thought we had something nailed down with uh, Roe versus Wade. That's been overturned. Now, I'm, I lean more pro more pro life. But still, we have that's that's something that's just this completely this upside down right now. Mm -hmm. That has to be straightened out. You yes. know, 
Yes. And then and then we have this. I mean, I'm looking at the young kids and I see the young kids. A lot of these kids are scared. They're scared about the future. They have no they have no idea where they're headed. They don't know where they're going to be 10 years from now. Right. You know, inflation is out of control. Inflation is crazy still. You know, we have they deal with that. Uh, prices are too high. People can't afford to buy a house. Interest rates are too high. You know, these are types of things that we have to really get a handle on if we're going to try to talk about not just talk through or talk around the issue, but talk into the issue, try to solve the problem and do And if anything, this is my recommendation today, whoever's president next is to handle one thing at a time. Don't try to do 15,000 things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, the real deal is uh, General Honore, as I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I did an introduction, uh, General Honore, you know, as you were uh, uh, joining the link. Uh, but, you know, one of your favorite comments was ignorance uh, can be fixed. Stupidity is for life. And we we <laughs> we drilled that home with your yeah. history of what you have done. Uh, but all the hurricanes you have been uh, involved in, all of the disasters you've averted for American citizens, the work is still doing to make sure that we stay safe and people are alerted to climate change and what those effects are. Um, but uh, what a career you have had, uh, General Honore. We mentioned your four, you know, four children, Stephanie, Kimberly, Stephen, and Michael, and your parents, uh, Udell and Lloyd uh, Honore. Uh, but your favorite food was gumbo. So I told them you had the keys to the city so my wife wants to visit New Orleans, so I need to find out whether you still have those keys because I may need to get into a club once in a while yeah. <laughs> and a good restaurant for some gumbo. Yeah, yeah. So how are you doing, yeah. sir? You're doing good. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, but we were just talking about what a, a incredible career you've had. Um, went through everything from when you had the, thir the 37 years of uh, service to our nation and uh, we are just so proud and so honored to, to have you on the show. We said, as we're going live into this new venture, you know, uh, streaming live, we wanted to have uh, the icon, American icon. And I mentioned as we started out that you should get your fourth star. I'm, I'm pressing Washington, D.C. to do this today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they need to do that because uh, we see we see you as a very, very valuable person. If they want to do something to bolster, you know, the parties and all that, you know, give that four star and I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid that train has left the station, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good. And it's, uh, you got backed up on a previous interview, but I'm here for you. Oh, I'm, thank uh, you, sir. Proud to be with you. Oh, I'm yes, sir. What y'all doing? Oh, okay. great. Yeah, we were talking about all the divisiveness and division in the country and why it's the time for us all to come back together again. You know, what, what are your perspectives on the nation right now and what we should be doing as American citizens, doing the right thing, supporting our military members, you know, making sure that we're doing the things that count? Well, take care of your business at home. Be a good citizen, vote, help your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And we all can do that and help the less fortunate. That's what makes America and every country a community that's worth living in. Because you can be the greatest looking country on the world, but if people are not living uh, in the community mm -hmm. and not don't have the benefits of uh, and amenities to live a healthy life, uh, it doesn't mean much because uh, we still have too many poor people in America mm -hmm. that uh, and many of them sometimes lose hope and they end up in doing the wrong things mm -hmm. because they, they didn't have the options of good education and health care when they needed it. So I tell people think globally but act locally. Stay busy as hell. There's no reason uh, for people to be bored because there's always people out there that need help. And uh, and if you're not doing that, then you need to get off your AZZ and either through your church community or a social group. And then encourage people to vote. And when you go, go vote, don't go by yourself. Take two or three people with you and oh. uh, double or triple your mm -hmm. impact because voting makes a difference. And one thing I am concerned about is that there's a group of people you see talking every now and then on podcasts and they get interviewed that. They're not enthusiastic about voting. Our people 
in particular and our veterans, they don't, they got an obligation because our ancestors died for the right to vote. You know, John Lewis got beat over the head. King got killed mm -hmm. because they were pushing this idea of voting. And our veterans from the Civil War forward, from the Revolutionary War forward, gave their lives uh, for freedom, for the right to vote. And that freedom may come to all of us at the same time, but it's here today. And it's a crying damn shame to hear uh, veterans say, well, I'm not going to obey because I don't think my vote makes a difference. Or to hear young people say, well, I didn't get what I wanted the last time, so I'm not going to vote. Uh, that's BS. you got to get off your easy, easy and go vote. And you can't tolerate people come and sit at your table and say they ain't going to vote. Run them off. Uh, yeah. You, you invite people to your table. You can mm -hmm. have grandkids and nephews coming around uh, driving their BMW after getting uh, getting sent to college and they're doing well or on the other spectrum they're suffering and say, well, the government didn't take care of me or I didn't get what I wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we owe it to our ancestors to go vote. And for those veterans that preceded us, and our ancestors, who many of them gave their lives for the right to vote. So uh, that's the kind of community participation we need to engage in. And as the uh, boomers, the older community, we got to, we're influencers. So we got to watch what we say around young people that we don't discourage them from participating in the community and trying to make their community better. Yeah, you know, that's so, um, that's so um, well stated. Um... Uh, General Honore, because, you know, one of the things I, you know, reading was recently doing some historical reading and that kind of thing. And one of the things in the post reconstruction period after World War Two uh, came in that the absentee of votes of veterans because of the army, we don't look sometimes at the army and the military as being an integrated force where yeah. we brought people from diverse backgrounds, cultures, and they became family. And yeah. That, that vote, when it came in, transformed the results of elections in the South, and it actually unified the nation. Uh, we would have had a different outcome if we didn't have that uh, influx of votes that were absentee valid votes from our veterans overseas. They are protecting our democracy here at home, even though they're serving overseas when they actually vote as well and vote for the right things for democracy. Well, I mean, you know, you can go forward as uh, as far forward as uh, World War One, mm -hmm. where uh, 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 African American uh, warriors that fought in World War One came home and they couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. They went fight to free people in another country, but came home and didn't have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And we know how long it took to fix that. Then they went to World War Two. And many of them came home and had the same problem. Yes. And it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act that uh, people weren't uh, put through some kind of test or uh, a poll tax or guessing how many beans in a jar. I mean, they had all kinds of ways to mm -hmm. silence uh, people from voting. Yeah. So even after we had participated in the Civil War, World War One, and World War Two, we still weren't given the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to give it up without thinking about the, mm -hmm. the, the, the the blood that was shed in order for people to vote, you know, is really, is is, is, uh, is criminal almost not to be voting. And well, the Voter Right Act, what was that, in 64, 65, and when the Vietnam War had started already. Yeah. Those young men uh, mm -hmm. uh, being drafted to go to the Army to go to Vietnam, and some of them were still denied the privilege to vote for various reasons. Mm -hmm. But they could go to Vietnam and fight for mm -hmm. the free, to help free South Vietnam. And uh, and they had separate schools, separate but equal. The Vietnam yeah. War started, what, in 62? Yes. Right. The draft right. was going on. We drafted people sent to Vietnam to, again, to fight for other people and didn't have the right to vote at home. So it was a very painful process our country went through. Mm -hmm. So when somebody said, well, I'm not going to vote because I didn't get what I want, I tell them yeah. you don't have the damn option. 
Because I don't want to see you if you're not going to participate in the uh, mm. a right that those who perceive you died to provide for you. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm. Now, General, how do how do we as a as a nation right raise up a better cadre of leadership? With looking at our youth right now, our Gen Zers, our millennials, and so on, how do we? What would you advise? People of my generation, what, what should we be doing out out there in the streets to get more leaders to raise a new uh, generation of leaders? Well, I think we just got to get committed to raising good kids. Uh, one of the problems we got is all kids are born good, but they got bad parents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The That's leadership. Soak in for a minute. Kids are not born bad. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. One with right. a clean slate. Right. And you know, you know, grow up and become a bad citizen because just because you're poor. Yeah, we were so poor we had two black and white TVs. One with sound and the other one with a picture. <laughs> <laughs> and the young and the dumbest would stand next to it and move the antenna around. Poverty, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> poverty does not uh, predestine you to uh, to uh, bad behavior. I, I give speeches all over the country, and many of them to Fortune 500 companies, the Fortune 100 companies. Matter of fact, I gave them that speech a couple of times in in, uh, in Chicago to even one time to the McDonald's headquarters. And they came over to talk about leadership, but the, the last part of my speech is your your biggest legacy is to raise good kids. Yes, yes. That's right. Yes. So yeah, you yeah. But there are a lot of people say, Well, we poor and they just gotta learn how to be tough and how to live on the street and uh there's only one parent in the house hell. Some of our greatest leaders were raised by single parents. That's right. That's right. That's right. So yeah. how do we embrace those kids in the community by having good public schools for them? I grew up poor, segregated community, but we had things like the 4-H club. And we had the new farmers of America. We were in America. We were in a rural community. And then uh, later on when I got to high school, there was even a Boy Scout troop and Girl Scout troops. All those things to augment the sense of teamwork and then we've got uh sports sports play a big uh role in our uh, in our school systems and yes. with the right programs they raise some very disciplined kids that aspire to go off to college i mean that's created a whole generation of multimillionaires in this country of our people who exceeded in sports yes uh so it's is how do we uh, create that environment where our children have community activities outside the home that help them grow and learn mm-hmm. to be a part of a team. But I go back to the fact I don't think it's a predestined because of providence. Is some kids just have bad parents because they were raised by bad parents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Wow. Yeah, you know, and you know, uh, General Honorable, mm-hmm. we were talking about the uh, black and white television and the antenna. I remember being a kid, and I, I, I was the remote. I had to get up and turn the channels, but it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't a difficult job. There were only three channels to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> <Back then. laughs> so. yeah, yeah, man, you had it made. Yeah. <laughs> you just but had that, one TV to move. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, as I was talking earlier too about you know some of your books, survival, how to a culture of preparedness can save you and your family from disasters, leadership in the new normal, and. Don't get stuck on stupid. I read all three, and I got stuck on all three books <laughs> uh, because they were not stupid. Not I think people all. need to know about the books, and they need to get them for their kids. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I recommend they go to your website and get your books. <laughs> yes. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, learn from a leader. That's what you need to do is to teach your kids to listen to people who know what they're talking about That's right. and have served the country. Right. They, this is who they need to learn about, mm-hmm. not some, uh, you know, uh, obscure, I understand. You know, I understand. Idiot. <laughs> in the corner, I understand. 
Dr. Arnold <laughs> doing some kind of crazy dance, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they but, need to, well, I'll tell you, you know. what, you show me good kids and I'll show you good parents. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. It's yeah. home training. You show me a flock yeah. of bad kids and I'll show you bad parents. That's true, yeah, sir. Yeah, that's yeah. true. So you so what the Lieutenant General Honor Lieutenant General Russell Honore is talking about and what he has lived. Yes. Yes. Live is a code of honor. Yes. Yeah. Honor comes from your home. Honor is associated with characteristics. Honor. If you're going to live a productive life, it's connected to honor. Yes. And yeah. you have you have four honorable people, uh Stephanie, Kimberly, Stephen and Michael. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, so this, this that's what came from a great leader. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. A great parent. Absolutely. And well, this is serving the nation. Uh, yeah. The two boys, both up in the family business, both up in the army. Yes, wow. yes. Look yes. at that. Look at that. Bravo. Yeah, Look at that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that is great. yes. Where are they now, General? What are they serving as? They're in Louisiana. One of them is a master sergeant, just got selected for the Sergeant Major Academy. Oh, wow. The other one is a captain uh, who's commanding the second infantry company uh -huh. in the Louisiana National Guard. So both of them right here in Louisiana. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for their service. Absolutely. Yeah. And Lieutenant General, I, Lieutenant General Russ Honore, I want to personally thank you because whenever I have reached out to you, whenever I have called you, emailed you, you never minimized who I was. You always were receptive. You always followed up. You always mm -hmm. embraced me. And so I'm grateful to you for that. And I thank you so much because it's nothing about you that's ego. You are genuine to your heart. And so, so you just, and I'm from Mississippi, so I understand it. That's, that's what, that's who we are. And that's what we did down there. We, we embrace and support each other. And when all that we had was us. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Well, it's good to be here with you. Well, you're an advisory board member for a reason, because you are a standard bearer of honor and character. Yeah. Well, the, old, yes. the old saying like, you know, old folks, you say treat people like you want to be treated. Amen. Okay. Oh, and I'm putting my signs together for the fourth star for General Honore. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well deserved. Well deserved. Yes. 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 <laughs> so, sir, thank you. Thank you, thank you General Honore, yes. for your time. Yes. And Any closing <laughs> remarks, sir, that you want to give? Yes. Yeah. Uh, wake up, America. Get off, <laughs> and go vote. Get off your AZZ and go vote. Wake up. That's America. right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> easy, easy. Uh, what, what, what were you saying, sir? We're not asking you to join the military. We got mm -hmm. volunteer military. Right. All you got to do to save democracy is get off your EZZ and go vote. That's right. Yes, sir. Right. And we're going to respect mm -hmm. it either way it comes, but do your part. That's right. The defenders of the Constitution and this country are the military. So don't let them down by not participating. That's right. If you if, if you were in the mil if you weren't in the military and you wave a flag on the fourth of July, you can go out and vote. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So true. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.